Do you find that Mr. Depp has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, yes. We even had more evidence. We had medical records. We had mental health records that went back to 2012. What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts and this is gonna be my last full video about the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard trial. I might use little clips of it in later videos to show examples or to compare certain things, but this is gonna be the last video entirely devoted to this trial. And then we can all go back to whatever our lives were before this trial started. More specifically in this video, I'm gonna analyze the body language and behavior of certain key players in the aftermath after the verdict. So we're gonna look at some interviews that Elaine Bredehoff did, that's Amber's lawyer, on some morning shows that has some really interesting behavior and body language. We're gonna look at Amber during the verdict and we're also gonna look at her sister, Whitney, after the verdict. Just a quick note before we dive in, I've turned on supers on the channel. I'm not even 100% sure what that means, but I was on the phone with my friend Eric and he said, you gotta turn the supers on, so I did it. I think it means you could put like stickers with your comments and I'll see them at the top or something like that. Really not sure, but for those of you who know what those are, the supers are on. Okay, let's dive in. And you think absolutely. Amber Heard is, in fact, a survivor of domestic violence? Yes, I, I absolutely believe that. And there's a tremendous amount of evidence, much of which did not come into this trial, did come into the UK trial. We even had more evidence. We had medical records. We had mental health records that went back to 2012 that were contemporaneous. We had text messages from Mr. Depp's assistant saying, when I told him that he had kicked you, yeah. he cried. So Okay, so that is a clip from the interview that Elaine Bredehoff did on CBS Morning. And this is a really interesting interview, and we're gonna look at it in great depth, starting with this answer. Now, as some of you know, it's very important for me to remain objective in my analysis, despite personal opinion. And as such, I don't like to only point out the bad or only point out the good. I like to keep it balanced. And whenever there's clusters of deception, I point them out for you. Now, for those of you who are new to the channel or new to just behavior analysis, clusters of deception is how we have higher confidence that deception is happening. Always remember, one sign of deception is never enough, and always remember that we're never sure. There's nothing that can ever happen that would allow someone like me to look at something and go, that's for sure a lie. That's polarized, I'm not interested in that. So we see clusters of deception, multiple signs at the same time that raise the likelihood that there might be deception happening. And when they happen, I point them out. In this case, when Elaine was asked if she believes that Amber was a survivor of domestic abuse, she says she absolutely does and goes on to answer why. We are not seeing a significant cluster of deception. There isn't enough in that moment for me to go, I think something's up, I would like to ask her a few more questions about that. Now, does that mean that she's for sure telling the truth? No. There are no absolutes in lie detection, but most of the time we want to see a couple of indications happening at the same time and we're just not seeing that here. However, we are seeing a couple of really interesting behaviors immediately after that. Right after tremendous amount of evidence, she says that didn't make it into this trial, but did make it in the UK trial. And there's a visible shift in her body language. When she says this trial, we see her head go down like this as her chin protects her neck and she's looking up. This is a very defensive position. Whenever we protect our neck or use our arms and hands to protect our vital organs, this is a very defensive kind of closed body language. It indicates to me that she might be feeling self-conscious and defensive when it comes to this trial, which makes sense. It was a colossal loss. But as she says, did make it in the UK trial, that chin comes up and we see a head tilt. A head tilt is pretty much the opposite of a chin down blocking gesture because a head tilt exposes our vulnerability. So we only do this when we're confident or comfortable with something. So this indicates to me that she feels a lot more comfortable with that UK trial than she does with this trial. You know, Amber had an enormous amount of evidence, although a lot of it was suppressed in this case as opposed to the UK. Also, I want you to notice that as she says UK trial, in fact, throughout this entire answer that we just saw, we're getting a lot of confirmation glances as her eyes shift from interviewer to interviewer to interviewer. 
By the way, when you see her looking to her right on that closer angle of herself, that's where the third interviewer is positioned, so that's her looking at him. And during this answer, she's really going back and forth a lot. There are answers later where we don't see this much, and we see very little shift. I believe that she's giving us a bit of a tell here. I think that when she's trying to sell an answer, something that she's not so sure of, she gives us those confirmation glances. She's checking with all three to see how well this is being bought. Now, although this is nowhere near enough to form a cluster of deception, this behavior is a lot more consistent with people that have low confidence in what they're saying. When people are being deceptive, they're a lot more focused on how effectively their story is being bought by their audience than just laying down the facts. In fact, this was one of the major differences I pointed out between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard on the stand. Johnny Depp was very much in his own little world. He was just saying the facts. He really didn't seem to care too much about who was buying it. He didn't look up and see, okay, who's buying it. He wasn't playing to the jury. Whereas Amber very often was looking at the jury, was really trying to sell her narrative. Remember, truth tellers tell, liars often sell. So once again, I think with Elaine, when we see those answers where she's really just focused on the one person, I think those are the ones that she's more confident in and she's just laying down the facts. And when we see those shifty eyes going back and forth, this is Elaine trying to sell this idea that she's not that confident with. Then we move on to what this tremendous amount of evidence is. So let's take a look and see, is it tremendous? Is it tremendous? So she says we have medical records and then mental health records. She lists those as two different things. Well, what are these medical records? Why weren't they admitted? As a lawyer, don't you think she would spend a little more time to say, we have this medical record? I think that the clue as to what she means by this is in another interview with the Today Show. Take a look. And they did, they were able to suppress the, the medical records, which were very, very significant because they showed a pattern back, going all the way back to 2012, of Amber reporting this to her therapist, for example. Oof, now that's an entirely different story, isn't it? Because now we have medical records, which are Amber Heard reporting all these things to her therapist. So those mental health records are the medical records that she's talking about. And in this interview, we get that clarity. But that's not a medical record at all. Amber Heard saying things to her therapist is not evidence of anything. So now if we go back to the CBS interview, she's saying we have medical records, we have mental health records. She's listing those like it's two different things, but it's not. She's trying to stretch that out because she knows that you really don't have that many records of anything. And then she ends with a slower cadence, really enunciating that the last one, which is we have text messages. Notice the way she's like just really emphasizing that from his assistant saying, when I told him that he kicked you, he cried. And once again, you know what? I wish Camille Vasquez was in the room here, just dropping that very famous line, objection, hearsay. Objection, your honor, hearsay. Objection, leading and hearsay. I'm going to object to the extent it calls for hearsay. I mean, what does that prove? It doesn't prove anything. The assistant told him that he kicked her and he cried. Well, if you told me that I kicked my girlfriend, I would also cry. It's not evidence. It doesn't mean I did it. Nothing about that proves that he was ever abusive. Now, in my video of Amber Heard being cross-examined, I gave you one of my little analysis secrets that I use very often, and I want to touch on that. What I said was that people subconsciously often tell us what their priorities are in the way that they list things. In an overwhelming majority of cases, we build up to the biggest thing. Now, a lot of you had some great comments about that. I wanna say this, there is an exception. When we're talking about something that's exciting to us, something we're looking forward to, we might begin with the thing that's the most exciting. So if I'm looking forward to something and you ask me what part of it I'm looking forward to the most, I might start big and then say, I'm also looking forward to this and that. But when we're trying to persuade, when we're trying to convince someone, we usually build up to the biggest thing last. So in this case, I believe that Elaine knows that they really didn't have that many medical records, uh, that the mental health record, which in that first interview, CBS Morning, she's separating, is the same as the medical record. It doesn't hold that much weight. And the thing that she has, that she thinks is the most, is a text from an assistant giving us an emotional reaction to something she said, which is like hearsay on top of hearsay. So I don't even believe myself that 
Elaine thinks to have that much tangible evidence. You had the evidence, as you say, but they did not believe her. Mm. Why do you think they did not believe her? I think that a lot of that was that it was Johnny Depp. Uh, I think the celebrity status. But yeah. she's a celebrity too. And, and it's but, not only wait, not but she's a, her. Yeah, but, she, but she's a celebrity too. Right. But you have to remember, it, we have, it's a tale of two trials. All the evidence came in in the UK. He had his opportunity to tell the truth then. I'm going to have to try really hard to not bring my personal opinion to this because personally, I despise everything about that answer. I'm going to try to look at the behavior. Um, first, she's asked, you know, you, you presented your evidence and the jury didn't believe her. And she's asked, why didn't they believe her? And we get something that Elaine is doing a lot in these interviews, and that is a non-answer statement or a refusal to answer the question. She is completely dodging the question. She does this a lot, multiple times. In fact, I would encourage you to listen to all of her answers and ask yourself how many of those answers actually answer the question, and it's shocking how few actually address the question that's being asked. So here, she tries to deflect completely. And I would borderline describe this as gaslighting because she's trying to sell this narrative that Johnny Depp is the one who caused the public and the jury to not believe Amber. Not the fact that Amber was denying things that we can all see with our eyes. Not the fact that Amber was saying things like, oh, I use pledge and donate synonymously. Not the fact that there were a lot of direct contradictions in her narrative, no, it's because Johnny Depp is a celebrity. Now, I actually love what happens there. Gail says, yeah, but she's a celebrity too, and even cuts off her co-host to say, no, 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 hold on, this is more important. And she's right. It's really important because if you're saying that the reason they didn't believe her is because he's a celebrity, so they're gonna believe him, then by your own logic, she's a celebrity too. So why doesn't that count? So that was a really good counter to that. And here we see Elaine, something fascinating happens. We see her stutter a little as her speech falls apart, and then she goes to a script. It's a tale of two trials. She says, this is the tale of two trials, which is this idea that she's trying to sell that the UK trial is more important because this is really about two trials. It's not about two trials, it's about one trial that you just lost. I think she came into these interviews with a list of things that she had to say that she had to get out. And the reason I think that is because if you compare the answers from this interview to the answers from the other interview, it's astounding how often she says the exact same things in the exact same way, and very often it doesn't even answer the question that she was asked. You know what I feel like? I feel like she's one of those like Furbies or Tickle Me Elmos that has like a set list of replies, and whatever you say, She's just kind of choosing the one that fits the most appropriately, regardless of what you asked. And again, I think within this answer, she's continuing this attempt at gaslighting. And by the way, gaslighting is not a word that I use lightly. I understand the implication of it. I've seen it ruin lives. I've dealt with it for a very long time. I have videos on the channel that teach you how to deal with it. But look at what happened here. Really look at the structure of those questions. She was asked, why didn't anyone believe Amber? She tried to deflect and sell a false narrative. Gaslighters do this all the time. She tried to sell the fact that it was Johnny Depp. Then that was countered logically, intelligently by saying, well, hold on, he's a celebrity, but so is she. Notice what happened. She completely abandoned that whole he's a celebrity thing. She didn't defend her position because she knows it was nonsense. And now she comes in with this. So you have to understand this is the tale of two trials. Well, what does that have to do with the initial question? This is something else gaslighters do. They try to just throw as much as they can to change the subject. So for a lawyer who's supposed to understand intelligent argument, linear thoughts, uh, you know, addressing one subject at a time, this is really messy. Subject change, trying to sell this narrative. She knows, she knows that she doesn't have legs to stand on. So yeah, to me, this is very, very gaslighty. Then to move further along this very manipulative path, she says something that I think is just not a great look, where she goes, he had a lot of opportunities to tell his truth, and she makes finger quotes. For someone who's supposed to be a professional, who's supposed to maintain a certain amount of class, who's representing her client on an international level, I think that doing those finger quotes is petty, and to me, seems like she's a sore loser. I mean, 
this truth was found by a jury of your peers in the county in which you practice law, overseen by a respected judge. You can't minimize that entire thing by saying his truth. That's, you know, if you wanted to use a different word, that's fine. If you want to say his version, his narrative, his story, that's fine. But to say truth with finger quotes, I find it petty. And I think it really indicates the overwhelming sourness that Elaine is feeling towards this case. Now we're going to look at a very well-worded question by one of the hosts, Nate Burleson. And before we do, I want you to kind of look at his body language while she's talking and he's just listening. Take a look and try to see what you think is happening with him while he's listening to her. States, But the other problem is we had cameras in the courtroom. So here we had, not only did we have a group of Depp fans that were there every day, a hundred were allowed in, they lined up at one o'clock in the morning for their wristbands to be in that courtroom, but we had everything on camera and we had tremendous social media. So for those of you who don't know, Nate Burleson is an ex-professional football player and usually when he talks, He's quite animated. We can see that when he talks, even when now he's about to ask his question, you know, he's very animated with his eyebrows, he's very expressive. But if you watch him on other interviews, he's equally expressive when he listens, when he's being asked questions. Usually he has a very pleasant demeanor. He's got a bit of a smile, but mostly relaxed face. I want you to look at his body language when Elaine is talking before he asks his question. There's a lot of stillness. He's sitting there um, with his hand on the table like this, sort of grounded in place. And when they cut to his face, we're seeing just a very neutral upper face. And we're seeing a bit of tension in the lips and in the jaw. I think he's extremely unimpressed and I think he disagrees. Remember, typically tension in the lips is disagreement or holding back certain words. Now, I think out of respect, he's sitting there, he's letting her talk. But I think there's a lot of disagreement there. I don't think he's on her side. I'm also gonna give you a bit of insight here from my professional experience, not as a behavior analyst, not because of my degree in social psychology, but with my performance career, I've done dozens and dozens of morning shows, including the Today Show, which is one of the shows that Elaine did. And before our interviews, typically, in most cases, the hosts come in a little bit before and we have a chance to talk to them, we have a chance to chat. It's not always the case, but it's very often the case. And in those moments, we create a certain quick chemistry. There's a bit of joking, a bit of pleasantries. So by the time the interview starts, there's a certain kind of casual vibe there. I'm not seeing it in this interview. I'm seeing some closed body language. I'm seeing some skepticism. I really feel like if they had that time before to chat, I don't think it went tremendously well. I think they sort of all went to their chairs, kind of looked at their notes, maybe a very quick thing, but I don't think Elaine took the time to sort of, you know, open them up and kind of get social and sort of kind of start that sort of friendly vibe a little bit. I don't think that that happened here. So I'm, I'm a former NFL player and after a hard loss, it's easy to wake up and point to the other side. Oftentimes I realized the better thing to do was to look in the mirror. What mistakes did I make as a player? What mistakes did our coaching staff make? And then how can we improve from there? Do you feel like you guys made any mistakes along the way? Do you feel like Amber made a mistake while she was on the stand? Because you're saying it's the celebrity, it's Johnny, it's the, it's the people who support him. But what about you and your team? Well, and, and that's an excellent question. And to say, and you know, Amber even said on the stand, I am not perfect. I am a human being. These people were giving her death threats. This is the kind of social media she was getting. So are any of us perfect? No. Is there something else we feel we should have done? Yes, I, I, absolutely. I, I always, I redo my closings a hundred times afterwards, whether I win or lose. Whew, that was a little intense. First of all, major props to Nate Burleson because he asked that question with such grace. It's a mark of a great interviewer and the mark of a great empath because he didn't start by saying, you know, you lost the heck out of that. What mistakes do you feel that you made? He related to himself to say, I've been through that. I've had losses as well. And when that happens, I do this. Did you do the same? So it's such a more pleasant way to introduce that. I also like the way he says after a hard loss, not after a loss. So I think here he's kind of just sort of, there's a bit of a jab there to say like, let's be honest here. That was a hard loss. And once again, look at Elaine's answer. 
It is a complete dodge of the question. She never quite answers it. She throws so much trash at it. So first it's, um, first she goes, that, 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 and that's a really good question. Well, if it's a good question, answer it. Because she starts by saying, uh, and you know, Amber said on the stand, I'm not perfect. That again is really trying to deviate that path because Amber saying she's not perfect isn't a comment on their strategy or how the trial went, or how she shouldn't have said certain things. She's just trying to once again take a chance over here to humanize Amber and make it seem like she's the victim. And now she switches and talks about the threats she's getting on social media. Well, what does that have to do with your strategy and what you would take back and what you would change? And then she goes, I always redo my closing afterwards, whether I win or lose. So, okay, what we're getting here is that after your closing, you thought about your closing. Not once in that whole disaster does she tell us, yes, I feel like we could have done this differently, we could have done that differently. And to me, again, the fact that she's entirely dodging this without giving it any reflection indicates that she came here with a plan and this question was not part of that plan and she is not equipped to handle this kind of inquiry. How that is she today, Elaine? How is she today? What is, what is her next move? She's right. Well, her next move is appeal. There were but a she's number. Heartbroken and... She is heartbroken. And one of the first things that she said when she came back from the verdict, when we went into the conference room, was, I am so sorry to all these women. That's, she said that? Yes. She felt like she had let down all of these women because she had more evidence than most people do, mm -hmm. and yet they still didn't believe her. And again here, we're getting one of those scripted sort of preset answers. It's insane. And we hear there, Nate Burleson asks, she said that? And there's a bit of an emphasis on that she. She said that? That's, she said that? Yes. She felt... And I believe he sort of has the same skepticism that I do. Did, is that really one of the first things that Amber Heard said? Like, it wasn't you, it wasn't the PR, this isn't a decision to be like, this is what Amber said. Did she really say those words? And in a minute, we're going to take a look as to why. I'm not so sure that that's what she said. But the fact that this script is so important to Elaine is a big part of that. In fact, on the Today Show, she started with that line. That was her first answer, almost the exact same. Take a look. Good morning to you. It's good, good to morning. see you. At first question, how is Amber doing? We saw her hearing that verdict. It took a long time to read. It was a sweeping verdict for Johnny Depp. How did she handle it? You know, one of the first things she said is, I am so sorry to all those women out there. This is a setback for all women in and outside the courtroom. And I, she feels it and she feels the burden of that. Well, and there it is. Same question, same script, same way. Uh, one of the first things she said, blah, 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 blah. So let's talk a little bit about script and if someone is authentic just because they say something twice and it looks the same and it sounds the same. So obviously, if I tell you the same story twice, there's going to be certain things that overlap, that are done the same way. It's the same story, it's the same person telling it. Let's look at some of the things that will have overlap. Gestures. Gestures will often be the same. When we rehearse scripts, when we tell ourselves what we're gonna say, whether it's an oral presentation, whether it's an interview, we rarely, rarely rehearse our gestures. We might rehearse our posture and say to ourselves things like, stand tall, be confident, relax your shoulders, things like that, but we rarely tell ourselves, okay, and as you say that, make sure to move your hand this way, and then move your hands this way, and tilt your head this way. We don't really do that. So if the emotion is authentic, if we tell it twice and we experience it the same way, it's normal for gestures to be the same. It's also normal for moments of emphasis and punchlines to be the same as well. Because we tell the story a couple of times and we note, okay, well that's effective and this is effective. And so we keep sort of those anchor pivotal moments more or less the same. If we look at Johnny Depp on the stand, we see exactly what I'm talking about because there are certain stories that he told during his deposition that he repeated when he was on the stand and there are certain elements that are the same but there's also a bunch of differences. So I'm thinking about mostly the fight that they had in Australia. When he talks about it, we see a couple of similar gestures where he says, the bottle flew by my ear. So he's talking about that bottle. He says, my hand was on the bar and he does the same kind of gesture. And some of the punchlines are the same as well. Like when he says, you know, my, my finger was like Vesuvius. And it looked like, a, it looked like Vesuvius, you know, and um, 
completely shattered. I mean, it's, it looked like Vesuvius. And this is because he said the story a couple of times before. He used that metaphor. It got a pleasant reaction. So it just kind of remained as part of the story. But we don't have that sort of switching over to a script and going through that rehearsed sort of canned answer. There was things he spent a little more time on, things he was different with. He re-explained because he's just re-experiencing the story. So yes, there are certain elements that are the same, but it doesn't feel like a recording. With Elaine, it's entirely different. This answer and the one that she gave on CBS Morning was pretty much that exact same thing. It was like this pre-recorded written thing in her head and she clicked it on. We even saw on CBS Morning that bit of a stutter as she gets to it and then she just feeds us this thing that she had ready. But here's the thing, you were able to get some evidence that you say demonstrated abuse. You certainly had her testimony. There were pictures, documents, all kinds of evidence. But in point of fact, the jury rejected it. You argued in your, in your closing arguments that if they found even one instance of abuse and it did not even have to be physical abuse, that they would have to find for Amber Heard. And they didn't. In that clip, I want to focus on the body language of Samantha Guthrie, the interviewer. So it's really interesting to me because she starts off by saying you had some evidence that you say demonstrated abuse. And it's funny that she says you say because, you know, that's not 100% necessary. She could have said, you know, you have some evidence that demonstrates abuse, but you say, like you allege. And as she's saying this, she's talking about the evidence that she had, you know, you had her testimony. Look at her hand. Her wrist is turned inwards as she's kind of making these small gestures over here in front of her. The wrists are extremely significant. Very often in conversation, I focus on the wrists. When someone's wrists are exposed to you, this is someone who's trusting, comfortable, and approachable. And when they're closed, it usually shows, you know, it could be anything from skepticism to being closed off, to being a little defensive, because our wrists, like our necks, like our vital organs, is something that we protect because they're quite vulnerable. So as she's talking about the evidence, all this stuff, her wrist is inwards, it's a little bit closed, and the moment she says, but the jury rejected it, with this thought, first of all, her voice softens up and her arms just open up. The jury rejected it. And this open arms is usually a welcome embrace. So to me, I have a feeling here that Samantha might be a little bit on the side of that jury or the sort of tone of social media in saying, look, you had all these things and we have this kind of closed wrist inwards gesture, but it, it was rejected. And also in that moment, it's just rejected it, we see a bit of a smile. Now, could this be sort of like, she thinks this is ridiculous? It could be, but I would see it playing differently if she was. I would see more astonishment. I would see her like, but they rejected it. You know, like how could they have done that? But it's, it's almost a softer smile with this open gesture. So I kind of feel like she's going, you know, you had this evidence, but was it really effective because the jury kind of rejected it? and I might agree with them. So at the end of the day, do I think that Elaine is being deceptive? Do I believe that Elaine stands by Amber? Does she believe Amber? I think that Elaine is very aware of the fact that they don't have a lot of evidence to stand on. I believe that she kind of gets why the jury ruled the way that it did because she's avoiding all those questions. But there isn't enough here for me to tell you I'm seeing likelihood of deception or that she doesn't believe Amber, or that she's not on Amber's side. In fact, I'm seeing quite a bit of loyalty towards Amber in these interviews. It's like she's really standing up for Amber. I didn't always see that, it wasn't always the case, but in these interviews, it definitely is. And I think I have a great answer as to why. It goes back to a social psychologist named Leon Festinger. Now, I do mention this on the channel quite a bit. I have a degree in social psychology, which is where my interest in human behavior started, and I acquired a lot of the basis of what I do today. And this man's work is, first of all, it's very much studied because Leon Festinger is the one who popularized cognitive dissonance, which we hear a lot about. There's a lot of articles online and you know, it's one of those popular psychology terms. But he also did this other really interesting thing where in the 50s, there was a cult led by a woman called Marion Keach. And she had predicted that the end of the world was coming on December 21st of that year. That was her prophecy. And anyone would intuitively look at that and go, 
right, we'll just let them be. The date's going to come. The date's going to go. The world's still going to be here and they're all going to go, okay, well, she's wrong and they're just going to leave. The cult is going to fall apart. Well, Leon Festinger had a different theory. He thought, for whatever reason, that the cult's bonds would increase after the failed prediction. And as it turns out, he was right. He actually infiltrated the cult and he surveyed members to gauge how loyal they are to the cult. And after that prediction date came and passed and nothing happened, their loyalty dramatically increased. And it's with this that he found that when we share failure, sometimes, in fact, often, it makes us commit even more to our standpoint out of fear of social embarrassment. Because if we admit we were wrong, it's really embarrassing all that time. And because there's nothing else to stand on and all we have is our faith, we increase that faith. We double, triple down on that faith because that's all we have left. And this is how a lot of people get radicalized in their beliefs. This also really closely relates to something called the sunk cost fallacy, which is a psychological principle that we often use to explain certain business situations or relationships. And basically what it means is when we've invested a lot of time and emotion into something, it's much harder for us to turn our back on it because our brain doesn't like to admit that it wasted resources. So it sort of makes up value where value doesn't really exist. So for example, you might know someone who has been in a relationship for a very long time with someone or romantically pursuing someone who is just not a great catch. You know, they don't really treat them right. Uh, they don't have much of a personality, just all around not a great catch. And you might ask them like, why are you with this person or why are you running after this person? And they say things like, well, you know, he's, he's got a great sense of humor and I feel like there's this connection there that it's, you know, I can't really explain. And they sort of see value in things that aren't actually that valuable or that tangible only because they've invested that much time into this situation. And again, their brain doesn't want to admit that it was a complete waste and that there's nothing there. Finally, the third factor that plays into this is that there's a ton of research done on the fact that if we go through challenges or hardships to be part of something, it really increases the loyalty we have to that thing. And we see this a lot in society. We see it in like hazing uh, ceremonies in, in fraternities or sororities where you get embarrassed or shamed or you do these big challenges to be part of a group. We see it in tribal rituals where they have all these different rituals and they eventually become part of the tribe officially. And all these things exist because those hardships that we went through, our brain backwards justifies and says, you did all that because there's value here. And, and it once again sees more value in that belonging. So we know that failure increases loyalty. We have the sunk cost fallacy, which is invested time makes us more invested. Then we have the principle of knowing that when you go through hardships with someone, it creates tighter bonds, and I think that explains Elaine's loyalty here. She has been going through hell with this case, but they went through all this together, and not just together in the courtroom, but all over social media. She talks about that a lot. So she knows that to the world, she's committed to this standpoint. She is on Amber's side. So I think there's a lot of things happening psychologically here that are really strengthening that bond between Elaine and her fidelity to Amber. Speaking of Amber, let's take a look at the verdict and what is going on with Amber and even a little bit still what is going on with Elaine at that moment. Question. The statement has a defamatory implication about Mr. Depp. Answer. Yes. Question. The, de the defamatory implication was designed and intended by Ms. Hurd. Answer. Yes. Question. The statement was false. Answer. Yes. Question. The statement has a defamatory implication about Mr. Depp. Answer. Yes. As against Amber Heard, we the jury award compensatory damages in the amount of $10 million. As against Amber Heard, we the jury award punitive damages in the amount of $5 million. Okay, so here we have actual footage of the verdict being read and this is the moment where Amber realizes that she did not win this and she's gonna have to pay a lot of money. And we are seeing some fascinating body language, especially, remember how often I talk about baseline? Well, this is so important because here we get to compare to her sadness when she was on the stand. Now let's go back and talk about her when she was on the stand. Whenever she was telling stories of sadness, 
we were seeing these big exaggerated sad faces with the frown face and I've talked a lot in other videos about how that seemed very unauthentic and she was looking at the jury with her chin up and presenting this sadness to them. Look how sad I am. Look how sad this narrative is making me. But here we're seeing something totally different while that verdict is being read and it's crazy because I said numerous times throughout her testimonies that in real sadness, when we're actually sad, we don't display it because sadness makes us vulnerable and in the way that we evolve, we've learned to hide vulnerabilities, we tend to go downwards and that's exactly what we're seeing here. And we're actually seeing for the first time in this trial what real sadness is supposed to look like because it's not over exaggerated. It's not these big expressions, it's subtle. The corners of the mouth are going down now, but that's, I've explained this before, because of the droopiness of the face. When we're sad, the face droops and pulls down the corner. So it's not that big exaggerated, my, my dog stepped on a bee, this kind of thing. It's just this subtle sadness. Now, grant you, it's not a huge dramatic grief sadness where there's a lot of tension here, where we're seeing completely her fall apart, but there's subtle sadness here. So what does this mean for Amber that we're seeing subtle sadness? Well, for me, it indicates that she's sad about the verdict, but she's not falling apart. And very often in behavior analysis, we look at what we see and we don't think about what we don't see. So I want you to think about this, really think about this. If you had just spent weeks, months, years even, telling the world that you were abused and you believe this, and she got on that stand and she said numerous times, you know, I, I was begging Johnny to not make me prove what I've had to prove here and I have evidence. And if you really believed everything that she said on the stand, that this is evidence, that you have, this is proof. And at the end of all that, you were told that, um, no, they didn't believe you and you're going to have to pay. Wouldn't that shatter your world to pieces? Wouldn't you be like, wait, what? I had proof. I had evidence. What more do you want from me? Would you not look at the jury like what is going on? So the fact that we're not seeing any surprise, any shock in her face is surprising to me. Yes, it's possible that a lawyer's prepared her and said, listen, you got to be prepared for all scenarios. It might be that, you know, they did a good job and the jury won't believe you. But still, when you've put so much time into something and you really feel that it's real, that verdict would crush your soul. I would expect to see shock, surprise, complete disbelief, disgust. So the fact that none of that is there and all we're seeing is this sadness. We're also seeing a lot of chest breathing because when we're comfortable and relaxed, we breathe through the stomach. When we're nervous, it's higher breaths. So we're seeing that she's stressed, she's sad, but it's kind of weird how at a time where I would kind of want it to be at an extreme, it's not. It's just the sadness of like, oh man, that is, that is not good news. And let's take a look at Elaine, because this is really interesting to me as well. She's on these interviews saying she 100% believes that they have the evidence and these are facts. Where's her shock? Where's her anything? She's just looking up and like, okay, yep, cool. And she's just like, like, look at her. There's a complete absence of all emotion. And again, granted, she's a lawyer. She's heard a lot of verdicts. Um, I, I bet at some point you develop a thick skin but there isn't even so much as like her looking over to Amber, comforting her, holding her hand saying, are you okay? Oh my God, I'm so sorry. It's like this news isn't surprising to any of them. Like they very much expected that this was a real possibility. And if you had that much faith in your narrative, your proof, your evidence, why aren't you falling apart a little more? And Elaine, if you really think that Amber was a victim and that this is a giant injustice, why aren't you more concerned? Because let me tell you, if I was sitting next to a friend of mine who just testified or a client of mine or an associate of mine who just testified and poured their heart out and really believed that they were a victim, the moment that I found out that the jury decided that they're not, my initial instinct would be, oh my God, I'm so sorry, are you okay? Can we get her some water, somebody help? Like, and again, this isn't something that I can control. It's innate, emotions are innate and there would be that concern. There is nothing on Elaine's face. Uh, you're welcome to come to my courtroom anytime. Well, give me a few weeks, but then you can come <laughs> any, anytime, okay? All right. Thank you, court is adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. All right.
Okay, now everyone is dismissed and we're seeing some really interesting behaviors. First of all, the judge makes a joke. Uh, she says, you know, you're all welcome back here. Actually, give me a few weeks, then you're welcome back. And everyone laughs, including Elaine. She laughs along participating in the sort of social vibe of the room. Then she does a double take over to Johnny's lawyers and they're all hugging and they're celebrating and she goes, oh, we, we need to do that too. Turns out and hugs Amber. It's fascinating how she sees that twice. You see her take notice, then she turns around and there's some hugging going on on Amber's side. Then Amber uh, gets up and storms off solo by herself. And look at her lawyers. Look at her entire team of lawyers. There isn't anyone who's going, oh my God, we, got, you know, we, sh we should go look after her, take care of her. Are you okay? What's going on? And that's kind of weird to me. Because once again, I know I said this already, but think about it. Imagine someone that you really believe in, that you think has told her truth and has been denied something this serious. Wouldn't you be like, oh my God, like take care of her, make sure she's okay. You know, but no one is. They're all at their table. They're packing their stuff. No one seems to be in a rush to go take care of her. And then Elaine gets up and sort of kind of waits for a few more people to go before she goes. It almost seems in that moment like she doesn't want to be the first one in the room with Amber. Now let me ask you this, based entirely on what you saw, let's go back to what Elaine said in that interview, that one of the first things she said when they went into the conference room was, you know, I'm so sorry to all women. Does this seem like an Amber Heard who's about to say that? Does this seem like an Amber Heard who feels sorry for all women, who feels like she let all the women down? Because I feel like if that was the case, we'd see a lot more despair, we'd see a lot more of her team consoling her, we'd see them walk off as a unit, there would be this sort of more somber vibe, but there isn't. She gets up, she storms off, we see sadness, but we don't see complete despair or, or complete grief. And this, to me, convinces me that what I said earlier about Elaine and her fidelity to Amber during those interviews is much more likely. Because think about this, she knows that the whole world is watching, has been watching, she's commented about that numerous times. We all know that she's on Amber's side and she's protecting Amber, but she's seeing that the emotional response to this massive defeat isn't quite right and consistent with someone who feels like they were very wronged. She's seeing that the evidence wasn't quite that compelling, that Amber had a lot of moments on that stand where she was falling apart, and now they suffer this great loss, and I believe once she lets that loss marinate, we're seeing exactly what Leon Festinger discovered, which is that that loss just increases her fidelity and that sunk cost fallacy increases her fidelity. And the fact that all these challenges happened and she went through all of this for this cause increases that fidelity. And there's a lot of psychology at play here that causes her to feel like there's more here than there actually is because her mind doesn't want to admit that this was all wrong and a giant waste of time. I want to end this video with something that I do quite often in my other videos and that's to give you a chance to give me your analysis and I really do feel like a lot of you will have some very interesting things to say about this one. So that is footage of Amber and her sister Whitney walking out of the courtroom immediately after the verdict. So presumably there was some time you know where she talked to her lawyers then they're leaving together. Now take into account everything I said in this video, take into account everything I've said in my other analysis videos, things you've learned on this channel, your own experiences. What are you seeing here? And I'll kind of give you some clues without giving you the answer. What is inconsistent here with what you would expect to see? So what are you seeing between the two of them? Um, so I'll give you a couple of things to talk about. First, the vibe between the two of them, specifically Amber's vibe, specifically Whitney's vibe, also where they sit in the car. I'm just gonna leave it at that. How, why is that important? Where they went in the car. And finally, we see Whitney do something before she is in the car. Uh, she, she grabs something. I don't wanna give too much away, but she grabs something. And what does that tell us about her priorities and what's on her mind? 
and what she wants to do next. So let me know in the comments what you think. I feel like all of you are very capable of doing this and I'd love to see what your thoughts are on this and I'll probably write a comment at some point and pin it on my opinion of what happened there but I uh, would love to hear your thoughts. So there was overall just a lot of inconsistencies with what I would expect to see if everyone really believed on Amber's side that Amber was completely wrong and this was very unjust. This isn't exactly consistent with what I would want to see. And then we have Elaine going on the news with this sudden undying fidelity and just saying some things that I think aren't a great look for her in that moment in Amber's name, which I find really strange. Let me know what you thought about this video in the comments. I'm excited to see what we're going to cover next.